Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Andrea Davis Pinckney, Brian Pinckney, and Jerry Pinckney. Thanks for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 100 videos of past events archived on our website and YouTube channel, so please be sure to explore. And now for my formal introductions. Andrea Davis Pinckney is the New York Times bestselling and award-winning author of numerous books for children and young adults, including picture books, novels, works of historical fiction and nonfiction. Her books have been awarded multiple Coretta Scott King Book Awards, Jane Addams Children's Literature Honor Citations, the Boston Globe Horn Book Honor Medal, as well as several parenting publication gold medals and La American Library Association notable book citations. Brian Pinckney is a New York Times bestselling illustrator who has illustrated numerous books for young readers, including two Caldecott Honor Books, The Faithful Friend by Robert D. Sansucci and Duke Ellington by Andrea Davis Pinckney, his wife and frequent collaborator. Mr. Pinckney has been awarded the Coretta Scott King Honor Award for illustration on three occasions and the Coretta Scott King Medal for In the Time of the Drums by Kim Siegelson. He is a five-time NAACP Image Award nominee, the recipient of many American Library Association notable book citations, and he was acknowledged by the National Council for Teachers of English for his vast contribution to the field of children's literature. And last, but most certainly not least, Jerry Pinckney has been illustrating children's books since 1964, illustrating over 100 titles. His, book has been, has, his books have been translated into 16 languages and published in 14 countries, and he has been the recipient of a Caldecott Medal, five Caldecott Honors, and five New York Times Best Illustrated Books. He has received five Coretta Scott King Awards and four Coretta Scott King Honor Awards. It is fans' deep pleasure and honor to introduce to you all three of the Pinkies. Take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. <laughs> I'm Brian Pinkney. And I'm Jerry Pinkney. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andrea Davis Pinkney. Lonnie, that was just such a warm and welcoming introduction. And you know, while we can't see everybody on this webinar, I, I can already feel the, the warmth in this virtual space. So thank you for welcoming us. And so I, I think, I guess, to um, get started, um, let me first say what a pleasure and honor uh, to be able to interview these talented individuals and collaborators. So I want to thank you guys for asking me to, um, uh, to participate. Um, and is it too late to say happy MLK Day? I don't think so. Yeah. We can say that. And what a powerful time to be leaning into Dr. King's message and words. Maybe our role is to amplify those words right now at this particular time. So I've drawn up a, a list of questions. And so let's sort of, sort of dig in. Mm -hmm. The two of you have collaborated on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in three books, Martin, Mahalia, His Words, Her Song, Hand in Hand, 10 Black Men Who Changed America where MLK was one of the extraordinary men featured and most recently Martin Rising, a requiem for King. And sit in, we certainly find the presence and the essence of Dr. King in that book. So my first question uh, is for Brian, starting with his first title, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Happy Birthday, uh, Dr. King by Jean Marzola. Uh, M -O and this is to Brian, of course, MLK was one of the most photographed individuals 
in modern times. How did you go about visually capturing the essence and spirit of this iconic civil rights leader? Very good question, Jerry. But I can't call you Jerry, I have to call you dad. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Uh, so, of course, the first thing I always do, and, you know, it all goes back to being a kid, visiting you in your studio when you were working on projects and seeing how you made artwork and all the research you did, the technique that you used of using tracing paper and doing sketches and then doing your finished artwork. That's always the ground that I use when I'm illustrating my books. Um, it's changed over the years with different books that I work on, but the foundation is what I really learned as I would say I was kind of your apprentice. And um, I can remember going to the library with you because you always did lots of research. And when you were do doing books about famous people, I remember you would have stacks and stacks of books, so many books that they were always overdue. And I would help you put them in the car to take them to the library. So I do the same thing. I just look at, you know, just hundreds of images of Martin Luther King and I would sketch. Um, in the case of the book, which I will share. This uh, first image here is the Martin Luther King, happy birthday, Martin Luther King. Um, it's done in scratchboard. So while my foundation was very much of what I learned about working in pencil and doing sketches, I later got my master's at the School of Visual Arts where I learned how to work in Scratchboard. So one of the approaches that I wanted to do and make this book special is working in Scratchboard, which is very um, kind of sculptural, sculptural in a way. Um, and what I realized is I could actually think about Martin Luther King as being very monumental. So I'm actually gonna show you the materials that I use. It's something called Scratchboard. And I'm using a nib like this, which is a scratch board, which is very sharp. And I scratch the drawing, which is a white board with black ink on it. And I would build up Martin Luther King almost like he was a statue. Very, very sculptural technique. And um, I wanted him to look like a monument in all the images. And that was kind of the framework for what I was using. So this is just a sample of how I did the work. So, and then I'll talk a little more about the other books when we get to those. And um, so my, my next question, of course, would be to, to Andrea. And um, that question is, Andrea, what did you draw from for research as well as inspiration on Dr. King and his mission? And I. And, you know, in going through those, your books, what I realized and, and what struck me was in Loretta Looks Back was the dialogue. So how did that all happen? Where did that come from? Well, um, again, good evening, everybody. And, and let me say, I also can't call you Jerry because you're my father <laughs> in my father in love. So here's a little behind the scenes of the Pinckney family. So I don't call my in-laws in-laws. Sounds so kind of impersonal. So Jerry is my father in love, um, the, the dad of Brian. Uh, and the, thank you, father in love. That's a great question. So, you know, Brian talked about the fact that Martin Luther King was such an iconic figure. And I know that for um, Martin Rising, Loretta Little looks back, even the presence of King in sit-in, you know, it was very important to me that kids see him as human, um, as, as a daddy, as a friend, as a brother. Uh, and I drew on his life with his family. Um, I spent a lot of time and have spent a lot of time in Atlanta, his hometown. Um, you know, I've spoken to his sister uh, who, you know, talks about the day her brother changed the world and, and gave that amazing I Have a Dream speech. And in the case of Loretta Little Looks Back, which is kind of written in, in dialogue and dialect, again, really wanted to make it very personal very accessible, very real, and very relatable. Um, he was he was so much, uh, and at the end of the day, he was he was a man, and and he celebrated our our basic humanity. Um, so that was important to me to convey that in all of the books of that I've written that where King appears. 
Good. Um, could we back up just one moment? Because there was something very interesting for me. Loretta looks back and that was that the language itself, where you were there, you were, you were there at that, um, at that, uh, that home of, the, um, of those folks. There was a little bit of uh, invention and then real sort of language. And I think the two of them sort of really sort of hooked me and took me inside of something. So um, can you just tell me, I don't tell me about that process. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to hold this up. I think Brian might, maybe you have the cover as well that we're going to talk about at some point, but this is Loretta Little looks back three voices go tell it. So this is the story of the little family and there it's, it's multi-generational. So their story covers three members of the little family tree. So we start with Loretta Little in a cotton field in Mississippi. She's a young girl. She's a sharecropper. Then we move to the 1950s where we meet her brother, Roly, who is still on that same sharecropping uh, patch of land. And we hear and discover all of the things going on in his world. And then finally, we meet 12-year-old Aggie B, who is the daughter of Roly. So this, these narratives are drawn from, you know, they say that social justice begins at home, activism begins at home. For me, it began at home. So the narratives that you read in Loretta Little Looks Back are stories that I heard at my kitchen table on the front porch when I was with my relatives who are from Virginia in the South, summer nights, fireflies, sweet tea. And, you know, I, I often say that I feel like I didn't even write the book. I feel like I was just this vehicle where, you know, these characters kind of woke me up one morning, started talking to me, and there I was just basically typing it. Um, and the idea is that, you know, it's, it's I'm kind of dubbing it a, a monologue novel. So it's very immersive, experiential, theatrical, and we really get behind the eyes of those characters, you know, deep in the belly of Roly B, you know, right, right, it, right on the tongue of, of young, young Aggie B. Um, and uh, so that's, that was the beginning of the beginning. And here we are with Loretta Little Looks Back. That's terrific. And, and um, now I'm going to direct this question, next question to Brian. And Brian, um, you were a child in Boston when I, in the 1960s, was active in social justice issues. However, you did witness my interest and, and growth and, and develop through various projects. I mean, it's and especially in the 70s, you know, I got involved with a lot of projects that spoke to um, um, African-American history and, and culture. So you were around to see me work on those projects. Um, and by the way, which I, I, I'm always stunned by it, uh, myself, but I say five decades, I was gonna say 50 years, but something like that seems like longer than five decades. <laughs> But that's how long it's been. Um, did those works affect and motivate your art and your interest in Black history and, and Black culture? Hmm. You know, I was thinking about this and growing up and watching you work was such an education on black culture, black history. And I almost took it for granted. You know, I didn't learn about black history in school, in elementary school. We weren't taught that. I was taught it at home by watching you. I remember you working on those Seagram's calendars and, and again, you were doing images of Martin Luther King and famous leaders and jazz singers in the black West. I learned about all those things by watching you learn about them at the same time. And again, I just remember you having images out and, and books out. And I remember mom, you know, helping you write those captions that went with them. So I was reading those and I was learning about all those characters. And to me, that was what fueled me, I think, to make my artwork. But almost it's just a natural part of my upbringing 
in the home where I was watching these things being made. And, that, and it came, I was thinking about that during the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening here in Brooklyn and New York City. And I thought, wow, you know, maybe I should go out there and, and march or maybe I just make the signs for people. I don't know, what can I do to help? You know, how can I be proactive? And I remember I was gonna join something for the election to register people to vote. And I wanted to call people and they gave me this website to go to and these prompts and these portals to do. And I thought, I can't do this. I thought, wait a minute, my gift lies in another area. And I was thinking about the quote yesterday at the school we were at with, it was something like, it was a quote from Martin Luther King, something like, if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. And this idea, but keep moving forward. And the idea that, you know, what you were doing for what wasn't called a Black Lives Matter, but you were making Black Lives Matter in the images that you did. And my place to contribute was being home, working in my studio on these books. You know, Andre and I just finished a series of board books called Brown, Bright Brown Baby Babies, which are all about, you know, beautiful Black babies that are going to contribute to you know, the literature and, and for everyone to look at, you know, and be inspired by. And I thought that's my gift. And I think one of the things we were talking to the children about was what is your gift? How can you add to the dialogue? What kind of actions can you take? But coming from a place that feels personal in your heart. So I really felt that um, coming from you and watching you and mom when you were working on those, those things back in the 70s and, and 80s. Well what was what was interesting about that time, I mean, that was the time when all of a sudden, I think um, people, um, folks in media, all of a sudden was aware of the fact that there was so little the, where uh, material being generated where people of color could not only just see themselves reflected, but they could see their lives sort of mirrored back in the way that they had hoped to be uh, looked at and viewed. And so um, what, what I remember about that time for me was taking the opportunity, okay, this is a way not only to do what I do so passionately, and that is make images, but I was learning about black history. I was learning as I was in that, in those, in that process of actually creating images, I was also so learning as well. Now, Andrea, I know your father, Phil Davis, participated in the historic march on Washington. Did his backstory play a role in your sense of, of purpose in the stories that you tell? I mean, um, I know that you weren't of age, but I would imagine that the stories went on and on and on and on in your household. Tell me about that. Well, um, that's perfectly accurate. They, they did go on. So um, I'm gonna just reel it back a little bit, right? So my dad, um, the late Philip J. Davis was one of the first African-American interns in the House of Representatives um, in 1959. And uh, he, I was born in Washington, D.C. I was born um, one month after the March on Washington. So dad went down to march with King. Mom couldn't go because the doctor said, there's too many, there's 250,000 people. There's a lot of heat. You're gonna have a baby shortly, stay home. So mom stayed home with her feet up. Um, and the story goes, you know, she was kind of just keeping cool with an orange popsicle watching it watching the coverage on television. And, you know, I always joke that I, I believe that even though I was in my mommy's tummy, I heard that speech and it had a very big effect on me. Um, my mom was a school teacher in inner city Washington. And, you know, I called her, you know, I joke with her. I call her, you know, the itinerant, you know, a, a, a book fairy because she was her, kind of her own civil rights educator, foot soldier, one of the things that she did was that her students often couldn't afford books, didn't have books in their home, and she was all about access and you know book ownership. So she would take books from her own personal collection, deliver them to the homes of her students, you know, dog-eared copies of Langston Hughes, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, all those writers, and just get them into the homes of her um, students' families. 
Um, the other thing is that my mom was one of the early pioneering uh, women of color in the League of Women Voters. So I just got it coming from all, all angles. And yes, these are the stories that I heard when I was coming up um, all the time. And, and, you know, Brian said it so beautifully. You know, I think I took them for granted. I thought everybody talked about this at home, you know, over the dinner table and, uh, you know, or on the front porch or in the evening. And, you know, these were conversations that we had all the time. You know, um, it's, it's funny, but when I was a kid, other kids during the summer vacations, they were going to summer camp or the beach or, uh, wherever, the lake or laying in a hammock or going on a road trip. And my family, every summer, we had the same quote unquote vacation, which was that we would go to the NAACP National Conference in June. We would go to the Urban League National Conference in July. And then as we were approaching back to school, moving towards September, my parents would, and I say it like this now, a little tongue in cheek, drag us along to the Congressional Black Caucus. So again, these were things I just kind of did. I was, I was brought to these events and I look back now and I just think how blessed I was to experience so many great speakers, leaders, um, you know, uh, folks who were the, 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 the forerunners, the, the trailblazers, the civil rights, um, you know, kind of, leaders at that time. And uh, those were the things that I experienced as a child. So that all just factored in to and continues to factor into everything I write and do and, and give to young people. Now, was there a moment though, um, where you began to sort of knit all of those experience together? Um, was there a time when you weren't being dragged, but you wanted to go uh, because their their your interest was uh, you know was uh, was sparked, um, or, or was it just a sort of a gradual thing where all of a sudden you realized you had that sort of um, um, you had a sense of uh, of a of a, a, a support system behind you, um, a a sense of who you were. Um, by the fact that you were surrounded by this, all this rich information and, and, and language and personalities, all of those things. It was it just a gradual thing that one day did you go, whoa, um, I have something here that uh, most people of color don't have that advantage or, of, of, of being able to take it in. Yes, absolutely. I remember once I probably was in middle school. And again, these were, this was like the annual summer. So we just knew, you know, people say, what are you gonna do this summer? Or when you get back to school, what did you do this summer? It was the same answer for me all the time. And I remember once in middle school watching, I think it was Jesse Jackson giving a speech. And I remember thinking, I am, I am mesmerized by this. I am, I am, I remember the, the feeling almost like coming out of a, a trance and like having a little, you know, having your lens pulled back and having a little perspective. I remember thinking, I, and I guess that's what comes with adolescence. You have a little more self-awareness. I remember thinking I'm really listening and I'm getting like, I'm, I'm having a feeling inside. And I think you described it so beautifully, which is that it was a feeling of connectedness. It, it started to kind of, you know, the, the dots started to be put together that, that I was, Part of something bigger, and uh, it wasn't just being dragged in our panel paneled station wagon um, in what we called the way back, you know, on a road trip. It was really being part of something bigger than myself, and that I, as a young person, was contributing my own drop of of, of love and awareness to a larger pool. Well, that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow up with Brian because I've been, as you were talking about your experiences, what I remember that um, we were in Boston, living in Boston between 1960 and 1970, and Boston had a very strong black artistic presence. I mean, it was my, our friends were involved with the arts, they were painters, and um, uh, then there was the Elma Lewis School of, of 
uh, of art, which was, you know, for kids and children of, um, of color. So Brian, tell me about that experience with, you know, the, the sort of circle I was, was in the space I was in uh, with fellow black artists and maybe talk a little bit about the experience of Elma Lewis, because in a sense, that was talking about black culture and black contribution. Yeah, so the Elma Lewis School was, I mean, that was like Andrew talked about going away on summer vacations to these different things. After school, that's where we went. You know, most kids were going to the playground. They were, you know, going to play football or basketball. We went to the Elma Lewis School of Arts and we learned about African dance. We learned about African drumming. We learned about, um, I do remember learning how to dance. I remember doing a play, you know, and, and I think even speaking the words of Martin Luther King. So it was just a place where all the arts were celebrated and it feels like my studio now where I just have lots of things around me that inspire me and um, to help me bring my art to life. All right, I, I'm gonna then pose this question and I want you guys to go, I think in both of you in, in length because we wanna focus on those three titles that I think that the van uh, audience wants very much interested in. So you can speak on those titles. Um, as as well as as well as the process. I mean, I, you, uh, your extraordinary abilities to gel writing and illustrating. So please tell us about your working process on those these three titles. Sit in. Loretta looks back, and most especially. Martin Rising. At, at some point, Brian, I want you to talk about that 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 lyrical, uh, impressionistic feel to your, your work. But um, I, you can take the two of you can take one book at a time, and that way maybe we get a sense of how you guys work, or mm -hmm. you can do it in, in you know whatever way you think works best for you. Okay, well, I'm, I have some PowerPoint images I think would be nice maybe to share those. And um, I'm gonna st we'll start with Martin Rising and show a few images. I also wanna show everyone how I kind of do my work because I have paper and paint here. Why not? You're all in my studio now. Uh, then, you know, one image from Sit In and then a few more images from Loretta Little Looks Back. Um, so first. Hey Brian, while that's getting queued up, may I mention something? Mm -hmm. which is that uh, what a lot of folks don't realize is that authors and illustrators typically do not meet each other. They don't collaborate. They don't go to Starbucks. They don't sit down together. And it is the role of the person in the publishing company to keep those individuals separate. It, it sounds counterintuitive, but the reason for that is that the belief is that the author should not be talking to the artist because the artist is gonna come up with something totally phenomenal that would be obscured or or kind of you know rooted out if if that artist has got an author in his his or her mind going ma 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 ma. So I've got a very unique situation. You know, I'm I'm married to the to the brilliant person uh, that is creating the artwork for so many of the books that I've written, and um, you know we're sharing the same tube of toothpaste and, and box of cereal. So we have a very kind of special unique way of working and, and Brian's kind of showing some of the images of Martin Rising. It's a good example of what I'm saying, which is that if you, you know, see that kind of amazing cover, you see Martin, which has such a spiritual quality to it. And you see the marchers down below, which are um, kind of inspiring Martin as he kind of gazes down, uh, you know, giving them his energy and taking energy from them. I mean, that is something that Brian in his studio, we're, we're not in the same place, by the way. I'm at home, he's in his studio. I'll see you later, Brian, when you come home. But, um, you know, so that's an example of, is if he had me saying, ah, I think the cover should be this, here's what I, blah, 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 he would never have come up with this image on his own. So, um, yeah, I guess so, right. The way it happens is I do, I come to the studio and I just kind of, play. So I figured I'd maybe before we show the rest of those slides, I will kind of show you how I worked on that book. And again, Andrea, 
doesn't see what I work on. Um, you know, we do get together at some point and share with each other different things. We have lots of kind of guidelines of how we can work together and stay happily married. Um, which if you want to know those, I'll just say quickly, Andrea loves showing me her stories that she's working on. I'm allowed to write in the comments, the first thing, honey, you're off to a great start. And then I can say whatever I want after that. One of the guidelines I set up for her is that if she looks at one of my pictures and she sees something like Al Vanilli's, like a book we did on, let's say Martin Luther King. She says, you know, Al, Martin Luther King's foot kind of looks like a football. She can't quite say it like that because it hurts my feelings. She has to say something like, Martin Luther King's foot looks unresolved. And then I can say, well, you know, I haven't quite finished it yet or make up some lame excuse. Anyway, um, so here I'm in my studio. I have my paints. The way I normally start, and this will be a sample of the way I did the art for the cover. I start with a field of color, of energy. In this case, I'm reading Andre's words and I'm like, this book is powerful, it's strong, it's about hope. One thing my mother always says is, Yellow is the color of hope. So it seemed like the right color to use as the background. So again, this is like a field of color of energy. I'm working very fluid with the watercolors. This is something that you may remember you taught me early on, you know, that let the water kind of move the paint around. And you kind of called it happy accidents that happen. So I'm putting some brown in here. Very, very quick with this. So this is an underpainting I had done earlier. Then I go back in with India ink and a brush. And I've used reference now, so I know what Martin Luther King looks like. And I think, okay, I'm gonna have him kind of in this field in the sky, but I'm gonna have him looking down, like Andre talked about it. He's gonna be looking down at marches below. So when I'm sketching, I'm not worried about making it perfect now. This is a sketch. It's more about the feel, as my dad was saying, like kind of impressionistic, expressive. Oh, I gotta give him a mustache. Martin Luther King has a mustache, there we go. I used to have a mustache, I don't anymore. There's Martin Luther King's face. Um, you know, always had a beautiful suit on. And then, like in this energetic field, this idea of the marches, because what Martin Luther King did, he didn't do alone. He had people with him always, you know, um, of all walks of life marching with him. So here I'm just drawing loose, abstract shapes that become a line of marchers. So a lot of times it's not so much that I can think of what I'm gonna do before I start painting, it's I'm letting the brush and the paint speak to me about what it wants to be. So I'm listening, I'm looking at the shapes that I'm making. So that's just a quick sample of the way I sketched the cover of the book. Now, now Brian, can I ask you about something? And that is, uh, there's a, um, visual element that you that runs throughout um, Martin Rising and that's sort of like arches. Where, where did that mm -hmm. come from? Okay, so I think where it came from is this idea that I wanted, we'll move to another image here. When I was doing research, I was looking at churches I was looking at the church that Martin Luther King gave his I have a dream his um, speech at when he was in Memphis. So this book takes place when Martin Luther King goes down to Memphis to help support the sanitation workers that are striking. And it's because two of them had actually been crushed in a truck that was malfunctioned because they weren't up to par. And Martin Luther King and the followers were protesting that these black sanitation workers should have equal rights as the white sanitation workers. So these represent kind of the two figures that the two people that actually died in the back of the truck. So the arches kind of reappear over and over again. Andra also talks about weather elements throughout. So sometimes the arches are kind of like representing the sky and like the heaven shining down. So you see that reappear. 
You can see it here behind these marchers that have I am a man signs. Um, it's still that yellow color of hope and the arches kind of shining down on them. Um, what I wanted to portray here is this idea that, you know, these were men and what it must have felt like to have to carry a sign saying, I am a man, to have to make that statement and the strength that it must take to do that. Here, the arch is kind of faint behind him. You can kind of see it. Um, this is a poem. It's very beautiful, you know, and Andrews again, her poems are so amazing that the images I wanted to complement the poems. I didn't want to illustrate them exactly the way they were, but I wanted to complement them, almost like my art was visual poetry. And I'll end with this image here, again, where you see the arch and Martin kind of looking down. And so Martin's in the air, Martin's rising, and his energy is supporting these marchers. Um, so um, I want to just keep going with the images. I'm watching the time a little bit. And um, I didn't know if Andre, you wanted to talk about Martin Rising at all, or I mean that you had mentioned the three books. Yeah, well, yeah. There, there is one thing, and maybe they can, they it can tie in together. One is that you know, for for Andrea, you know, this book doesn't hold back. I mean, there's no dumbing down, or um, it, it it tells the truth. So, Andrea, tell me about why. Why poetry, or even where did it come from? Um, that um, what place did that spring from? Where you decided to tell this particular story through through poetry? I mean, what what goes into a writer making that decision? I mean, a poet does, you know, writes poems, but you have different voices. So why did and how, you know, this particular voice and this particular story. Well, um, let me just briefly say, and I, I'm also being mindful of the time, that the way Martin Rising was born, so to speak, is that Brian and I were at a Martin Luther King Day party. It was in a big art artist loft. Uh, it was families, friends, neighbors, children, grown up. You know, it was during the day. And at some point, somebody got into the DJ box and was mixing with the music, the words of King speaking them. I have a dream, you know, I've been to the mountaintop, all of that. And there was such an electricity in the room that I looked at my husband and I said, Martin rising, like you could feel it. And I just knew at that point that we were gonna create this book and that I was gonna use poetry because it has such an emotional quality to it. The other thing with Martin Rising is that it does chronicle the final days of King's life. So for young readers, you know, and an, and an assassination. Um, so for, you know, how are you gonna write about that? For young readers, the poetry does a couple things. It serves to kind of insulate from, you know, from the atrocity that is an assassination. Um, it also, you know, poetry has a reputation of being kind of quiet and contemplative. It, it, in this case, it's the complete opposite. You know, it, it's Martin Rising is meant to be used in a very interactive fashion. I've seen schools do it as a reading, a reader's theater. Um, I've seen groups of kids, you know, on Zoom and in other venues. You know, each take, uh, you know, sections of it and and read it like like a like a Greek chorus. Um, about a year ago, pre pre COVID, uh, in Chicago, it was adapted um, by the North Light Theater in Chicago with young actors playing the roles. So poetry allows for musicality, um, interpretation and, and, emotional, and an emotional quality that you can't always get in prose. So that's why I chose to do it that way. What I think is remarkable for me is that, you know, you, again, you've chose poetry and then Brian brings his sort of lyrical quality uh, and movement to the, his, his art. So the two of them make it very accessible to deal with the, the, the content, the subject. I mean, um, uh, and so that's remarkable. And, and, um, and certainly, you know, there are, there are these, there are two, there are voices, you guys are like a, 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 a duet in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, in this particular case, serious matters. 
And you see and, King's you know, thread. Oh, go ahead, Brian. No, I was going to say, um, and I didn't know, Andrew, if you wanted to talk about uh, sit-in at all. I only have the Carmen Bitch then. But then I also have some interiors from um, Loretta Little looks back in the cover again. And I was just thinking about how you do this amazing thing with poetry where you keep expanding your, your vocabulary and where it's not just, I would say, you know, there's poetry and sit-in and there's also poetry and theater, as you mentioned, and uh, Loretta Little looks back. Thank you, Brian. Do you want to show that cover maybe? Yeah, you know, as a, as a writer, I have a job, especially when I'm, you know, working with young people and books for young people. And, and it, my, my job, so to speak, is this, and that is that I need to reach out a hand and invite a reader onto a journey. So I try to do that with each and every book. So in the case of Sit-In, you know, it, it opens with this big quote by King, we must meet hate with love. And there's a narrative refrain, which is, they sat straight and proud and waited and wanted a donut with coffee and cream on the side. Those kids didn't budge, they didn't move. Until they were served, they refused. All they wanted was some food, a donut with coffee and cream on the side. And so, and, and we'll be doing this more tomorrow, but we really engage kids in what that must have been like to be those kids, those students sitting there you want to eat and you're not getting you're not getting fed so again my my I, I i really need to get that reader right by that collar invite them in to something that's like an experience what does it feel like sitting at that counter being ignored uh, there there is we want to leave some time for questions and 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 and, uh, and answers but there's one last question I, I and you can expand on this or you can keep it short but and as the two of you, um, what do you want and hope people, especially young, the young, to take away from your, your body of works? And especially, especially in this crucial time of racial awareness and consciousness. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I will speak in terms of my artwork. It's something that, again, I think I got from you, which is to look at my art as I look at your art and as everyone looks at your art and be visually inspired, you know, and to see like black faces, to realize that these books aren't just windows uh, or just mirrors for other African-Americans, which they are and black Americans, but also they're windows for other cultures to look into so that we understand this rich tapestry that we have in our country and of all different nationalities and that all stories are important and valid and especially for us, the creators of books about black lives and black people to be able to share that and for that to inspire other children to want to continue to learn more and accept. Yeah, I would say, you know, um, I'm looking, um, Daddy in Love, at the picture behind you, the portrait, which is your great granddaughter, my great niece, Zion. And, you know, I see that young face with that, those bright eyes. And Brian, do you want to quickly, maybe like in two seconds, just run through the, the Loretta Little um, images? Because yes. they're so uh, arresting, you know, those um, interiors. And in answer to your question, Jerry, you know, really what I want young people to take away is that you, no matter how old you are, you have a voice. You can speak up, you can be part of this movement. You can bring, you know, you can write a letter to, uh, you know, a, a congressman. You can make a sign, you can write, um, you can write a poem, you can do a play. Um, in the case of Loretta Little, you know, here we see this young girl and the three voices, you know, we start with, you know, young Loretta saying, Right here, I'm sharing the honest to goodness. And then you see that family tree, um, the three generations, and then Brian, the next one. Here's young brother Roly who says, I'm gonna reach back, tell how it all went. I'm gonna speak on it my way. And again, each is affirming, I'm gonna tell it, I'm gonna speak on it. And uh, that's kind of the tagline or the, the, the running hashtag, if you will, for Loretta Little is go tell it. So that's the opportunity. And this is the last image we're going to show, which is, this is my favorite image. This is 12 year old Aggie who, you know, I love the way my husband has just kind of distorted her hand. Here she are, here she is in the segregated 
south of the 1960s. Um, members of, of SNCC come down to her Mississippi church and they ask for volunteers of who wants to register to vote. Again, these are sharecroppers. They're afraid of you know, their, their oppressive bosses and the forces that are going on. Nobody raises their hand except for this young girl. And I, I just think that image is so, so telling. She is raising her hand and saying, you know, she says in the narrative in the book, she says, I know I'm too young to register to vote, but my hand, I felt like my hand had a mind of its own and that my, it was gonna fly off the top of my wrist and, and there she, she just cannot resist being part of it. So that's what I want young people to know, get that hand up. Well, I, I think we, we going to probably should open up for some questions and answers, but I, I did want to make, I guess, a, a comment. And that, and that is in fact that the two of you together, I mean, there, there, is, there are so many pieces and layers, which I, I, I want to just mention because it's because of the quality of your voice, Andrea, and the quality of Brian's art that it entertains in a way, but then it educates. And then I think finally, which it, it nurtures, um, it, it, it plants, seeds um, for the young readers. Uh, by the way, um, we are talking about two people who work in, in children's literature, but your work speaks to all of us. And so I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for that. Now, Lonnie, are there questions? There are. And uh, first, let me just say, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone watching, uh, especially in such a momentous week. Um, kind of bracketed by both MLK Day and the inauguration tomorrow to have the insertion of such a beautiful, loving, warm, artistic, generous spirit and tone. I, I feel it's sort of a balm for some frayed nerve endings. So I, I couldn't be more grateful to all of you for taking the time tonight in what is probably a busy week for you as well. Thank you so much for your service to our communities. Really appreciate it. Um, so let's get to a couple quick questions, um, common questions. I'm sure these are not the first time you've heard some of these, but some folks want to know what advice do you have for aspiring children's book authors or illustrators in general? Um, someone, you know, what, what kind of career advice, some practical tips perhaps? Um, I, would, I would say um, write often. And, and I'm gonna add that with aspiring artists also draw often, all the time. I have journals, I'm sketching it all the time. Um, my stories, now I'm writing them on my iPhone. Um, there's so many different technologies that you can use to write, to get things done. And then have people look at them, you know? And for young people, it would be your teachers and maybe um, after school programs, your art teachers. I would start there. Hmm. Right, I would say Andrea, write every add? single day. Real writers write daily. You know, people say to me, oh, come on, do you write on Christmas? Yes. Do you write on your birthday? Yes. Do you write when you have a tummy ache? Yes. Do you write when your house is a mess? Yes, especially because I don't want to clean it. So, so write every single day, read everything, go out of your comfort zone, even if there's things, eh, I don't like this kind of genre, I'm not, read it. Um, and uh, the other thing from a very practical standpoint is, there is a great organization called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. The Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, www.scbwi.org. Highly recommend it. Timing could not be more perfect. Their winter conference is in about two or three weeks from now. And you can register and it's, gonna, it's free. The conference is free because it's virtual. So we'll send out when we send out the recording to everyone, we'll include a link to the website that you just mentioned. Uh, Jerry, did you want to offer any? Yes, I, 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 um, and I agree with what they both said because that's what it really is about. It's, 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 it's in the work yeah. and it's in the art. And so, in order to, it doesn't happen unless you make it. Um, there is one thing that I did want to sort of mention, and that is develop a strong sense of curiosity. And that can lead you um, to history, it can lead you to, uh, to, to the art museum, it can lead you to all 
kinds of places. But the thing is, develop this sense of curiosity that there is, there is so much out there and I want to take it all in. You know, I want to see everything. I want to read everything. And, and, and I want to actually begin to find a voice to express uh, my thoughts on those things that I, I'm interested in. Uh, Andrea, question. Um, in terms of, actually for both of you, first another probably quick answer. Uh, some folks want to know, well, where did you go to college, both you, Brian, um, Jerry, Andrea, and what did you study? What did you major in that kind of, maybe that was also a little bit of what put your feet on a path? Well, I went to the University of the Arts that um, was then Philadelphia College of Art. My father had also gone there, <laughs> you can talk about. And then I actually got my master's at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And, um, you know, that was just a little more education. I felt like I needed it. And um, the, both programs were exactly what I needed. And Andrea? Yeah, I went to Syracuse University to the Newhouse School of Communications. My focus and concentration was magazine publishing. And that was my big dream was to work at um, you know, very high profile magazines, which I actually did. Um, I was a senior editor at Essence Magazine. Um, I worked, uh, you know, at CBS Magazines, which is where I met Brian. And CBS at the time was the holding company for special interest magazines like Woman's Day and Field and Stream and Mechanics Illustrated. Um, so I went to Syracuse. And I have to say what I learned in journalism school is exactly the skills I use today, which are writing with economy and even papers like the Wall Street Journal are written at a sixth grade reading level. So that was very good training okay. for me. There's been a couple questions, especially in light of how you described both of your childhoods and adolescence. Um, looking at, uh, you have children of your own, Andrea and Brian. What is, how do you see the, the way that you are shaping their learning experiences and their youth in adolescence and young adulthood um, do you have some comparisons and, and contrasts between, uh, obviously you were both so impacted by your parents' lifestyles and the things, Andrea, very affected by what you said in terms of how you spent your summers. Um, what do you see, what are you replicating or what's different uh, in this era for both of you as you're parenting? Um, you know, I will say one of the gifts that I had uh, from my parents was the freedom to play and explore. And what my dad was talking about in terms of curiosity, you know, we went to museums, we went to theater, we went to dance, you know, we made art, we took music lessons. So it was a very broad kind of palette that we've, we got to explore. And with our kids, we did the same thing. And we gave them a lot of freedom to kind of find what they were interested in. You know, I'll say my son, um, you know, loved to dance, yet he wasn't ready for traditional dance classes until he was ready for them. And now he's a professional dancer. You know, our daughter also took lots of art courses constantly, was always, you know, engaged in summer camp and very social groups and, and was a leader. You could tell she was just the leader. They called her a little prime mover, I think in kindergarten. And um, now she's getting her master's at NYU and social work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Do they, um, you know, especially Andre, when you're talking about how you spent summer and just thinking about how the impact I was particularly taken, of course, you're a poet and a writer and thinking about your phrasing when you were talking about how um, there was a point that you felt as an adolescent, and I think I, I even was typing while you were saying it to make sure I got it right, where you said that um, you started connecting the dots and that you became aware that you were a part of things. It became something that was different than your, as an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old. There was a point when it was gelling for you, um, that influence, the incredible influence that, um, you know, how, what is brought into a home, you know, even if uh, a parent maybe can't necessarily have some of these most inc more incredible experiences that you had as you were growing up, but what is brought in and, and how it has this kind of a, like a contagion effect within you, like it seeps in, you know, kind of like osmotically almost, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep, that's very true. You know, it's interesting because um, I'm, I'm again looking at my father in love and I'm looking at Jerry, your book, um, A Place to Land. Your, your many, you know, one of the part of your Martin Luther King canon and, you know, of course, when we visit and our, our kids are with their grandparents, 
um, you know, my father-in-law, Jerry, and my mother-in-law, Gloria, um, I, I see with each and every visit, um, the kids are, there's a, 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 a transformation that happens in each and every visit, you know, just because we are, we are a family and, and you said it, Lonnie, right. You know, we all come to discover we're part of something bigger. Um, even if, you know, your family of origin or your immediate family isn't nearby, you know, there are many families and, and we, we come to realize that, that we're part of a, a bigger continuum. Jerry, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, when I was thinking about, of course, when you're talking about your five plus decades of uh, participating in and observing activism in the United States, and kind of curious as to what are your perceptions of today's young activists? Uh, how do you kind of compare and contrast those movements as well? What you see today, whether it's with Black Lives Matter and other organizations, what are your impressions? Well, that's a very interesting question. And, and because there, you know, when I was in Boston during the 60s, and that was certainly when uh, we started to see and, and feel the, the rising of, of the civil rights movement. And, um, and, and then there was a, and, and we, 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 there was energy that was, was, it was electric. And then there was, and then there were lots of lots of young people as, as well from college and university campuses, all participating in this movement. And then there seemed to be a sort of a dry spell where, where we were all getting very comfortable mm -hmm. and thinking that, okay, it's, it's behind us. Black Lives Matter. And to see those young folks out there of all races, um, it energizes me because I can't, I can no longer march the same way. I can't pick it the same way. But to see that banner being picked up and carried again by young people, it's powerful. From for where I sit, it's it's just a beautiful sight. Do any of you, we have just another minute or two left. Do you have any thoughts as we enter into the inauguration tomorrow? Um, the celebration of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. yesterday. Um, where where are your heads right now? What what's what's the feeling? What's the combo of your heart and mind right now? I want to go back to Martin's words, and I want to find ways to amplify them because this is such a perfect time to lean in on and his words and his message. This is what we're, this is where we are. And I keep thinking about the fact that what would Martin think now? Or what would John Lewis be thinking at this point? Now we have this uh, new administration coming on, coming in and uh, into office and there is this sense of buoyancy, this sense of hope. Uh, and what the young people add, going back to that other question, is the energy is there, and that's that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Brian, thoughts from you? You know, I, the Martin Luther King words that always come back to me is, "We must meet hate with love." And it's like, what does that mean when we see so much violence and hate and anger? How do you meet that with love? And then it's like, well, what is love? And it's, it's caring, it's trying to understand. Um, it's listening underneath what people are saying and are asking, whatever side they're on. And, and what will that love look like? It's a question, you know, we must meet hate with love. What is that? <laughs> what, is, what is the action that we need to take? And for, for me, it's, it's making my books with love. It's, it's promoting them. It's getting them out there in front of children. You know, for a congressman, it may be something else. For a parent, it may be something else. Um, but really trying to understand what, what is behind those words would seem so simple, but so hard to do. Okay, and Andre, I'll let you close us out for tonight. You'll have the parting okay. words. Okay, sure. So um, speaking of closing, I will just say that the final poem in Martin Rising, and this has been on my mind in answer to your question, Lonnie, the last poem of the book is, can a dream ever die? A burst of sun replies, his life well lived for peace and good. Martin's spirit still alive, 
and with love we all shall rise. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I got goosebumps. I wish all of you um, continued good health, safety, love of family. Thank you so much for coming for FAN. We'd love to have you back. It was a beautiful night. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in.